The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The steady state magnetic levitation of current carrying conductors over a ground plane demonstrates magnetic forces due to conduction currents. This cylindrical conductor carries a current I. The current is returned in a conducting plane just below. It is alternating at a high enough frequency that both the conductor and the ground plane act as perfect conductors. The current in the conductor and oppositely directed current in the ground plane distribute themselves in the surfaces in just such a way that the magnetic flux normal to the surfaces of the conductor and the ground plane tends to be zero. The magnetic field between the conductor and the ground plane is the same as that of a line current and its oppositely directed image. These two currents are positioned so that the magnetic field is tangential to the ground plane and to the cylindrical conductor. Parallel currents in opposite directions cause a force of repulsion. To better understand the repulsive force, let's look at how the current and magnetic field interact here at the bottom surface of the cylindrical conductor. At a given instant, the current density is in the axial direction, while the magnetic field is phi directed. The current density is in the axial direction, the magnetic field is phi directed. The current density crossed into the magnetic flux density is the force density acting on the bottom of the conductor. The force density acting on other parts of the conductor also has horizontal components, but these cancel. There is even some force density at the top of the conductor acting downward, where J is the same, but B has reversed direction. But that force is smaller because B is smaller on the upper surface than on the lower surface. This is because of the proximity of the lower surface of the cylindrical conductor to the ground plane. The net force F on the conductor is upward. When the distance xi from the ground plane to the conductor center is much larger than the cylinder radius R, the upper image current is at about the cylinder center, while the image current below is the same distance xi below the ground plane. The Lorentz force is the length of the wire L times the cross product of the current I in the conductor with the magnetic field B from the image current, a distance two xi below the conductor. We can equivalently determine the net force per unit length acting on the cylindrical conductor by using conservation of energy. The vertical position of the conductor is xi. The inductance for a cylindrical wire of length L is a function of the vertical displacement xi. R is the conductor radius. When the conductor radius is very small compared to the vertical displacement xi, the inductance formula simplifies. Conservation of energy tells us that the force on the wire is 1 half I squared times the derivative of the inductance with respect to xi. When xi is much greater than R, the force is identical to that derived using the Lorentz force. In the experiment, the current carrying wire has been wound into a pancake-shaped coil. Line current at 60 hertz is supplied to the coil through flexible wires, which are connected to a variac. Here is the actual experiment with the pancake coil excited by 60 hertz current from this variac. The current is measured with this clip-on ammeter and indicated on the oscilloscope. The ground plane is this aluminum sheet. Its thickness is 1.27 centimeters. The coil has a thickness of about one and a half centimeters. Uh -huh. 
A typical current in the coil is 20 to 30 amperes, so it's made of large diameter wire to reduce its resistance. The 250 turns are of number 10 aluminum wire. Aluminum is chosen for its light weight. Its density is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter, so that for a given current and thus magnetic force, the coil will, will rise higher than if made of copper. Although copper is a better conductor by a factor of about 1.6, its density is about 3.3 times greater than aluminum. The scope trace indicates the coil current. Here again is what happens as the current is raised. The force on the conductor results in vibrations which we hear as telltale evidence that the current is being increased. The force is proportional to the square of the 60 hertz current. These vibrations result from the 120 hertz second harmonic component of the force. When the RMS current is large enough that the Lorentz force can overcome the coil weight, the coil lifts off the ground plane. Increasing the current further results in an increase in the levitation force at a given altitude. So the coil rises to make the upwards magnetic force equal to that of the coil weight. Let's see if we can estimate how high the pancake coil will rise for a given coil current. We are limited in height by the maximum current before we blow a fuse. Focusing attention on a single turn of the circular coil with radius A, with A much larger than the wire diameter, we can approximately use our inductance formula for a straight wire of length L if we take L to just be the coil circumference 2 pi A. If we had N concentrated turns in our coil, the inductance increases by N squared. One factor of N arises because there are N turns, each carrying the current I. Thus, the net current that is effective in producing the magnetic field is NI. The second factor of N is because the flux link by all N turns is N times that link by one turn. So the inductance of the N turn coil is roughly that of a one turn coil multiplied by N squared. In our experiment, we have a pancake coil rather than a single concentrated circular coil with a single radius. Our 250 turn coil has an average radius of about 9 centimeters. Because of the large variation in radius from 2.5 to 16 centimeters, it is not clear what effective radius A to use in our approximate inductance formula. So we choose to write it in a generalized form in terms of the parameter L0. We can estimate a value of L0 equal mu0 A n squared by using the average radius of 9 centimeters, so that L0 equals 7 millihenries. To estimate L0 for measurements, we use this inductance meter to measure the coil inductance as a function of the coil position xi, where xi is measured from the ground plane to the midpoint of the coil. The coil inductance is measured at 1 kilohertz, so that the ground plane acts as a perfect conductor. At 1 kilohertz, the skin depth is much less than the thickness of the conducting sheet. The coil inductance increases as the coil height is increased. Here, when the coil rests on the ground plane, the coil inductance is about 1.7 millihenries, while when the center is at about 5 centimeters above the ground plane, the coil inductance is about 5 millihenries. Our measurements are shown as dots on the plot. L0 has been estimated to give a perfect fit to this mid-range data point at xi equals 7.25 centimeters. The value of L0 fitted this way is 1.3 millihenries, about one-fifth what we estimated. The discrepancy is in part due to the large size of the coil with the winding distributed over radial and axial positions. Our model assumed all the end turns to be concentrated. When we use L0 equal 1.3 millihenries, our formula approximates the position dependence of inductance over most of the range of xi.
Now that we know from empirical measurements how the coil self-inductance depends on coil position, we find the magnetic force as a function of coil position by differentiating the coil inductance with respect to position xi. The gravitational force that balances the magnetic force is constant. For a given RMS coil current I, the coil height xi will adjust itself so that the magnetic force just equals the coil weight, mg. We solve this equation for I. The current required to just lift the coil off the ground plane can be estimated using as the position xi half the coil thickness. Then, with the pancake coil mass of 1.8 kilograms in the 1g gravity field of 9.8 meters per second squared, with xi equals 0.75 centimeters, half the coil height, and with L naught equal 1.3 millihenries, we calculate the liftoff coil current to be about 14.3 amperes RMS. We reconnect the pancake coil to the variac. The clip-on ammeter measures the current, which is displayed on the oscilloscope. We raise the current slowly and find the coil lifts off. at about 15.5 amperes RMS. What we predicted was 14.3 amperes RMS. As we raise the current further, the coil height above the ground plane increases. Here, the coil center rises by 2.25 centimeters at 20 amperes RMS. We take other data points by increasing the current further. Here is our 20 ampere data point. The solid line shows the estimated mid-coil position as a function of RMS coil current. Discrepancies between theory and experiment are due to our many approximations. In particular, errors are amplified because our force computation depends on the derivative of the inductance with position xi. Also, how good an approximation is it to assume that at 60 hertz, the coil and ground plane are perfect conductors. The skin depth in aluminum at 60 hertz is 1.1 centimeters. At first, one may think that for the assumption of a perfectly conducting ground plane to be accurate, the frequency must be high enough that the ground plane thickness is greater than the skin depth. For our experiments thus far, the aluminum ground plane thickness has been 1.27 centimeters. This thickness is about a skin depth. To demonstrate the dependence on ground plane thickness, we can try a ground plane with half the thickness. This plate has a thickness of 6.35 millimeters. This is about half the skin depth. Remember that with 1.27 centimeter thickness, liftoff occurred at 15.5 amperes. With this half skin depth thick ground plane, liftoff occurs at 16.3 rather than 15.5 amperes RMS. This current is only slightly higher than with the 1.27 centimeter thick ground plane. Even though the ground plane thickness is now about half the skin depth, it still acts essentially as a perfect conductor. With a one millimeter thick plane, the coil does not lift up even at 30 amperes RMS. The ground plane is now so thin that most of the magnetic field penetrates through the ground plane. We just blew a fuse again, but this time because of an arc. The enamel insulation on the wires may not be enough to prevent arcing to the sheet. We have just seen an example of this. Let's try it again now with some gaffer's tape for better insulation on the bottom. Here it is again with a current of 30 to 40 amperes.
The coil doesn't lift off, but the induced current does make the ground plane very hot. Our coil has the making of a burner for a stove. Our thin sheet could be the bottom of a pan. Our experiment has been turned upside down. The protective border prevents spillage. Let's turn the current up and let it heat for a while. It takes a while, but it does cook. The experiment demonstrates the magnetic induction of current in conductors and both the resulting Lorentz magnetic force of repulsion and the heating.